inadequate infrastructure, the weak educational systems, or even their inappropriateness to the needs of the market, the poorly designed social safety nets, and poor governance. So imagine a balance of all of all a balance of payment crisis or a widening fiscal deficit on top of all of this. And you can understand the complexity of the situation. <coughs> Tackling the long-lasting issues is a must. And it has to be done through both structural reforms that would evidently lead to some redistribution of art as well as the distribution of income, which has always made it very difficult and costly. While getting rid of the old regimes was hard, dismantling the complex web of economic powers and centers of old regimes is all is in order to create a more competitive, collective, and fair economic environment, maybe even harder. Post Arab Spring, we can expect and hope that the emerging authorities have enough of a mandate to tackle these issues, but to increase the chances of success, high economic growth should be achieved in order to minimize the cost of the distribution. So the question is how to achieve growth and how to generate more employment opportunities in the short term in order to simultaneously meet the higher expectations as well as prepare the ground for the much needed structural reforms that are essential to promote sustainable development. Some of the questions that are proposed in the introductory question in the program that has been distributed to all of you point, in my opinion, to the wrong direction. The solution to the challenges is not definitely not a step back from the principles of liberalism and open fair markets. The solution is not more government as employer of last resort, and hence a fat and inefficient administration that is not held accountable to the highest standards of quality, control, and control. The solution is not directed lending to favored sectors and the solution is not blood lines between each of monetary policy, fiscal policy, and trade policy. The time now is one of great challenge for the newly elected authorities to navigate the thin line between breaking from the past but without moving back into the failed experiences of the old times. Ladies and gentlemen, let me elaborate. Some may think that the economic freedom brought by the outgoing regime over the last few years have failed to deliver, and it may therefore make sense to go back to the economic the regime of the past in one way. Huh? That would be a big mistake. And we need to derive the right, the right lessons, not the rushed conclusions. The truth of the matter is that liberalism, in its true meaning, was never fully implemented or even proposed in the Arab world. And therefore, we cannot claim that it has failed. Macroeconomic stabilization in the concerned Arab Spring countries over the last period of the outgoing regimes have reduced this 
stabilized inflation and the exchange rate and improved the balance of payments and fed the real estate boom but it was covered with non-transfer privatization deals that sold state assets to favored parties. Often toothless regulatory agencies and weak institutions, especially in the judicial and development policies that revolved around expensive subsidies rather than being empowered of the limited income class or even effective social safety nets. The Arab Spring was against political but also against economic and social marginalization. It was a vote of no confidence in the economic and social policies of the past. The appropriate response to these challenges is, in my opinion, a three-track accelerated reform agenda. The first track, tackling political, institutional, and judicial reforms, is essential so that to ensure accountability, transparency, respect of the rule of law, as well as good governance. Only separate yet balancing powers of the executive, the legislative, and the judicial coupled with the freedom of press can provide a system of effective checks and balances that is integral to sustainability. But also a political discourse that is frank with the people about the economic realities and the sacrifices that need to be done today to reach the high potential tomorrow. Instead of selling them false and unachievable dreams. The political discourse is highly needed to manage expectations and protect the transition. The second track is an effective policy agenda that tackles in a comprehensive and dramatic way the superstructure, such as the ease of doing business environment, and the upgrade of laws related to business and labor, with a view to encouraging both local and foreign investment and private This effort should also tackle productivity enhancing measures that upgrade not just the superstructure, but also an equally important their infrastructure, which can be achieved not through the budget, but at concessionary terms through the Arab development which will bring with them, in addition, to funding a breadth and wealth of experience and best practice. In this context, the decision to increase the capital of these funds by the latest Arab Economic Summit is welcome and timely initiative. Upgrading the infrastructure should be accompanied by the establishment and all the empowerment of the government regulatory agencies in the key sectors such as power, telecom, and transport, so that to ensure the quality of the services and the competitive prices. Last but definitely not least, the third track consists of better designed social safety nets that move away from expensive and inefficient subsidies that help those who end up consuming the most and not necessarily the most needy. And closer towards targeted support that help protect those that are most affected by change and provide security to the rest of the world. Arabs have the advantage of late come of being late come that can use the experience of other countries and freshly designed social safety nets that foster the emergence of a middle class, which could significantly contribute to growth and stability in the region. The example of the Brazilian bonds of India is a model to follow and is indeed 
being followed by several countries, such recently as India. So our governments should be. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the responsibility does not only fall on the countries that are undergoing a transformation. In an increasingly interrelated world, the West and the rich Arab countries have a stake in seeing a successful transition. This would be an indirect investment in their stability and in their security. The need for success is a global and regional need because the alternative is highly costly to everybody. It is a shame that until today, actual assistance remains significantly short of the commitment made during the G8 meeting in Dubai regarding the allocation of a sum of $80 billion to support the economies of the Arab Spring countries. Europe, despite its crisis, has a lot to offer, and not just financially. The experience of integration of post Sitsumi European countries into Europe, and especially the role of the EBRD, could be very useful for the Arab countries. Strong Arab Arab integration is also needed, and in this respect, I can, can tell you that I have launched during the Arab Economic Summit that took place in Kuwait in 2009, an initiative regarding stronger Arab development and economic integration that touches on many sectors, ranging from energy, water, transportation, environment, and food security, as a way of bringing closer the Arab world and bringing the widening gaps among its people. These cross-border investment projects are a win-win situation. It is essential to note that this initiative is in no way based on a concept of charity, from those who have to those who have less, but is rather based on a concept of the region investing in its own well-being, in its security, in the broad sense in its development and welfare. But we need to start acting and not just continue talking, which requires, which is a matter that requires a political way. The recent Arab Economic Summit in Riyadh has launched, has launched some initiatives, but to be honest, we need to move from ideas to implementation. It is no longer acceptable to still talk about intra-Arab railway. We need to start building. It is no longer acceptable to talk about free economic zones. We need to start delineating. Starting from here. Here in North Africa. Where it makes most sense to open the borders for the free flow for the free flow of people, trade and capital. It has been there. And nothing has been done since then. For years and years. Ladies and gentlemen, the political and economic and social landscape is changing. What has happened in North Africa over the last month should be a wake-up call. So much time has been wasted. So many resources have been thrown away. The U.S. in 2020 may no longer need a report. It's time to ask ourselves, what are we going to offer to the rest of the world in 5, 10, 20 years? What seat will we have on the global economy table? Even more pressing, what are we going to offer to our youth? Which are our greatest resources? Maybe a good place to start is by looking inward and ask 
how to send the final provider, the needed value added, complete and sustainable solutions cannot be designed by any Arab country alone, regardless of size or wealth. Good governance, partnership with the private sector, and intra-Arab integration are the way forward if we are serious about talking, about tackling the momentous number of challenges facing us in the years and decades to come. So are we serious enough? I am not with this question. And the